Welcome, everybody, to the We Are Libertarians podcast. I am Hody Johns. I am joined by Reinhold. We are the, uh, we're, we are, I am temporarily standing in for the Batman of Chris Spangle today. Um, I won't do nearly as good a job as he does, but um, I like to think that you love my charming and nerdy personality. Uh, other than that, Reinhold, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing all right, and I'm here to counter that charming personality with a lot of gruffness and assholery. <laughs> And that's what makes us a great duo, right? That's why you need both of us. <laughs> it's, a, right. it's a Taoist thing. You need yin and yang. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We, got it. we need a little bit of both. And, and you got to, uh, you know what? I bring way to, too I, much of one. You bring way too much of the other. And that is how <laughs> things balance. That's how you stay safe. Right. The only other uh, Asian philosophy is to get rid of both the good and the bad, which is, uh, that's just a rough way to live life, I think. You just got to gotta take a little bit of the both here. Not that... Not that there is good and bad. I don't know. This is way too much philosophy for a, for there, a talk. That there we're about there to just have. is, to be honest yeah. with you. There just is. There just is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's, I don't want to paint this as like one of us is bad or one of us is good, you know, because then all of a sudden I'm naive and you're the smart, you're the smart no, 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 guy no. and I'm the nice naive. That's a complete misunderstanding of yin and yang. It's, yep. They're both important. They're both necessary. Neither one are evil. Neither one are good. Yeah. They are yeah. just what they are. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, uh, the stimulus. Bill, the uh, CARES Act is what we're going to call it. Remember how it was always Obamacare? And then finally when it got passed, um, when it finally got passed, that was like, it became the ACA. So it's now the CARES Act. It was going to be the COVID-19 stimulus bill or whatever, but now it is finally the CARES Act. And uh, we, we love to care. Caring is good. Uh, they always name these things something well, it does have a it does have a longer title so the official title is oh, it, it says the this act may be cited as the uh coronavirus aid relief and an economic security act or oh, right. cares because that's what's that acronym comes out to right aca doesn't stand for nothing it yeah it stands does. for yeah it stands for affordable care act it doesn't stand for yeah. nothing yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, I so this did is... stand for nothing. Okay. No, 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 no. There, there's actually, uh, yeah, it's. They always uh, try to try to shoehorn in an acronym. Right, a very so. pleasant sounding acronym for sometimes things that are unpleasant. Look, I think we can do some breakdown now. We can get into the if they should have done this, how much they should have done, how it's going to be done later. But it's passed. There's not much we could do about that, so let's just go ahead and spit well, some. President still has away. to. President still has to sign it. It which is. I, he's going I believe to sign it. He's <laughs> going to get signed because when somebody threatened to hold it up for literally 43 <laughs> seconds, he had a freaking meltdown. <laughs> yes, he right? did. So uh, uh, also, before we get started, just want to say this thing is huge, mm. and I would love to be able to come on here and say that we have gone through every line of this and know it backwards and forwards, but we. That's just not enough time. Even no. I don't know how the senators and the congressmen who voted on it. I mean, they're they're finding things out now. Going, hey, wait a minute, what about this? So, it's going to be a fun time. Uh, but we will find a a few things in here that we can talk about. I'm sure. Oh yeah, it's it's not. It is not even theoretically possible to read <laughs> everything. They they even have it broken down in sections. I did everything I could to skim and scan and get what I could off of it. But, I mean, journalists are still putting together everything. I mean, uh, to put it in perspective, the plans that they rejected were like 1,119 pages long. And this, this is, is this is a little bit long. Something. Yeah, this, yeah, 800 and something like that. So we haven't had time to even look at all these proposals they have doing. But, I mean, who are we kidding? The Congress people haven't either. They're just passing it or not passing it. Well, the, uh, last, uh, the last Robert Jordan book I read was like, what, 700 pages, 600 pages, and it took me a month? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to get through this in a, like, three days. There's no way. Right, yeah. And, and that's, you know, if you fully understand everything, this is very, it's very dense. Obviously, the wording is all legalese, which can be, which is, it, it's kind of like reading Shakespeare. Like, when you get used to it, you get a little faster. But at first, you're like, I, I got to go word by well, word right now. <laughs> and the worst part is, is they will say, okay, this changes the line in – bill code numbers such and such where you have to go look that bill up to find out what they're even saying in this part of it you know yeah yeah so it's complicated yeah so you and i are going to break down as much as we can uh in a couple hours here and and provide as much information as we possibly can again if something comes up later that we didn't understand it 
correctly. That's probably right, but we are doing our, we did do our best. I've got my due diligence. I've pulled up, I've got a whole bunch of screenshots and stories and breakdowns from Reddit and the New York Times and The Intercept and people that have looked at it. And so I am doing my best, but as usual, things come up later that you didn't quite understand. Uh, we are still finding out things about things like the Affordable Care Act and the Patriot Act that we're like, oh, they can do that? Oh, how about that? <laughs> and we're still finding that out years later, decades later even. We're like, oh, I guess there was that loophole. You know, for I think it's funny for all the specifics there are, which make it dense, sometimes it'll just be like very general to just say, you know, $500 billion to big businesses. You know, like, oh, okay, what's what's big? What's... How'd you come up with that number? How's that 500 gig get distributed? Well, we told these guys to do it and we trust that they'll, they'll do it. Okay. You know, a group of people hacked this out. Yeah. Uh, a group of Republicans and Democrats. Okay. Our, our side will agree to, if you do this and your side will agree, if you do, we do that. And that's how they throw it together. Right. I did want to uh, open up by talking about how this thing it co comes to be, because I think a lot of people hear $2 trillion. And what, how is this, is this a loan or did we sell that much in bonds? Is this an unsecured liability? How does this affect the debt and all that type of thing? Cause that's what I thought at first. And uh, there's actually two different ways when you see a bill get passed. Um, there was a great breakdown in the intercept. Now I should warn you, this is the intercept and the person who wrote it is Stephanie Kelton. She actually was like working at the department of treasury uh, she she worked in some high up stuff with like the fed and the department of treasury and the irs and on the democratic side she is left-leaning she very much supports this bailout it's just a heads up but it is it is a great breakdown and her insight is always very welcome into this type of thing because she understands this type of thing so there's a, two different types of bills that get passed there's one that's just a it's called a pay for is how they talk about it. And so when something gets passed, they say, well, what's the pay for? You, you've given us two, you know, uh, in this case, $2 trillion, what's the pay for? And they'll say, okay, well, we've instructed them to pay $2 trillion. Them is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve will put $2 trillion and spend it. They have some leeway. Like I said, that $500 billion to large corporations, that's, that was not me just throwing off a thing off the top of my head. They actually are instructed now to make $500 billion and give it to large corporations in the form of a loan. So that money will actually end up going back to the Fed. In that case, that's actually a pay for. So parts of this bill are, bill are actually pay for because it will supposedly get paid back. That always doesn't always end up happening as we know from these other things. And sometimes the, uh, the, the inflation doesn't offset what was actually owed and all that, but that is actually the pay for. Now in some cases, for example, $560 billion going towards individuals. That's probably the most famous part of this act that everybody's talking about. The, the where's my, people ask, you know, where's my Obama phone? You're gonna be able to ask, where's my Trump check? <laughs> and uh, in this case, that actually has no pay for. So this has been instructed to be given to individuals and there is no clause that says this is how it's paid for. So the federal, uh, not federal reserve. Oh yes, the federal reserve is going to, they don't have to print it off because the instructions are to put it in your account based on your 2018 and or 19 uh, refund. They'll put it in the account that you had direct deposited there. If you didn't, that's a whole other set of shenanigans. If you didn't file, I do have some information there. It gets very convoluted and complex, but there, long story short, there is no pay for, for that. It is not going to get paid back. So they're just, that's money that's added to the economy. This happens with bills sometimes. Uh, when we talk, this is literally inflation. This is how inflation works. Money that gets added that doesn't have to get paid back. It increases the cost of everything that we know. In this case, it's going to individuals. That probably goes to the philosophical side of whether libertarians can get on board with the Federal Reserve, if they're going to print money, should be giving it to individuals as opposed to corporations, crony allies, that type of thing. So that's basically the long and short when we talk about where this $2 trillion comes from. Some of it is paid for, some of it is not. The stuff that is not paid for, there is no loan that we're taking out for it. It's just money that's in the economy that will that 
essentially our kids are going to pay back or in this, in, in this sense, everything is going to get more expensive. This is what happens when you add more money into a fiat system. When you say this apple is worth $2 and it's the only apple in the world and, and there, there's $1 in the system. So this is going to be worth 50% of all monetary supply. This is a terrible example. This apple is not worth that. But you say, if it is worth 50% of all monetary supply, if you add another $2, that means there's $4 of money supply. This apple will now cost $2 because it was still worth 50% of the total monetary supply. That's a very broad way of thinking about it. When you talk about your own personal finances, when we finally break this down to you, it's still based on monetary supply, but basically you have 0.000001% of all money that's in the system. And you spend all of your money based on that amount. Now, if that amount doubles, you still will only have 0.0001%. The cost of everything will just increase. So there's a little bit of an offset since the money has been given to an individual you as a person, you at least got the money to help offset the cost of everything going up. Now, some individuals don't qualify for any cash back. Some individuals only qualify for some of the cash back, but not the unemployment cash back, in which case having more money might not offset it. But I just wanted to, to break that down because I know for people like me, that's the question that I always have is when I say, what's the pay for on this bill? What is, how is this being financed? How much of it? A lot of times there's a loan they manage to sell. They'll ask the Fed to sell a certain amount of bonds and those bonds will are, that's actual debt because they're required to be paid back. This is not going to increase the actual debt. It's simply going to inflate the costs of everything that's in the system. Did I say that in a very dense enough way there, Ryan, Reinhold? <laughs> Pretty dense way, but there's also another aspect to this too, is the first line basically of this is that the, um, the bill does not follow PAYGO rules. So uh, a while back, they, I think it was 2010, they initiated a law that said the base, that if they were going to have a bill comes out that spends money, they have to be able to say where they're getting that money from, whether it's this tax source or this tax source or how they're going to do it. This bypasses those. So there's no tax money uh, coming in that they're associating with this. This is just money that they're going to be giving out uh, without, without any source of, of revenue to coming in pay for it either. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that is something that, that is new, unique to this bill. So when you're thinking about it, this is just all things to keep in mind. That will make the debt go up. Yeah. I guess <laughs> let's start. Already is. Yeah. <laughs> let's start with the breakdown uh, at the moment, now, of course, the best they can do is estimate this, but $560 billion to individuals. Um, and it is going to be $300 billion worth of cash payments. If you are an adult, employed or not, uh, $1,200 a person. Uh, I, I did check. Now, it doesn't look like there's actually, they were saying maybe people who earn more than 75,000 do not get this. Did that make it so, to this final bill? So as I understand it, if you make over 75,000, then it starts gradiating down. When you get to about 100,000, then you don't get anything. But that's for individuals, for, for married couples, that doubles the amount. So it's double of the 75, right? So 149 up to 200,000. Uh, you get it on the, on the, on the double payment of the 2,400. Got it. So if you're married and you make 75,000, it's not going to be a problem as long as your wife doesn't also make another 75,000. Right. Okay. Got it. So that, uh, the way that is going out, the way that's going to be distributed is, and, and people are, because that was my first question is I'm like, Hey, if you're giving out free money, I'm first in line. This is the best trick or treat party ever. You know, 1200 bucks. They're actually going to send it to the last place the last direct deposit, either 2018 or 19, they're not going to do any history prior to that. But if you had direct deposit for your uh, your, fed, your your check for your uh, uh, your tax refund, they're going to send it to that. It is automatic. You actually don't have to do anything as long as you filed in 2018 or 2019. If you filed for 2019, don't let the wording confuse you. That would be the one that you did recently for the previous year or 2018, the year prior to that. If, if your direct deposit information is changed or using a, di a different bank account, 
you absolutely need to tell the treasury or call somebody like right now because your check is going to go someplace else and if that a bank account let's say if it's closed it'll just bounce and that's not as much of a problem but if it's still open but you don't have access to it because it may be a divorce or that's just not your main account you don't have a card or it's very inconvenient you open it when you're in a different state and you don't visit that state anymore but that account is still open it is going to go there and so you will need to make sure that you have access to the account or call the irs department of treasury and let them know Hey guys, um, you need to uh, you you need to update my direct deposit information. You should do it very quickly because, like you said, Trump has yet to sign it, but he is absolutely going to sign it. And they may do this instantaneously. This is government, so that may take them up to ninety days, but it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to take ninety days because the whole point of this is to get the money in people's hands so they'll calm down about the situation and be a little more. Uh, compliant with staying in the house and not going out and getting a job so that we get, you know, somebody gets, gives you some money. You can say, okay, the reason I had to go out and, and potentially put myself and other people in harm's way is mitigated a little bit because I have enough money to buy groceries for the next and pay rent for the next couple of weeks. Correct. So they're going to rush that out. Right. And that's, so that's 500 billions of it. The next part here is extra unemployment benefits, which is $260 billion of it. Now we uh, we had a funny thing we talked about it a little bit Ryan hold the other day um, in our in our special chat sorry um, that if you are if you declare unemployment you get a certain amount everybody knows there's some unemployment benefit usually it's very small negligible some people don't file for it all Jamie and I were going to be out of, out of work for a couple of weeks we work at restaurants we don't claim our tips so we make two dollars and yeah come at me IRS I don't care we make two dollars and thirteen cents an hour. And unemployment state is different, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so the the states kind of vary between 250 a month, a week to 500 a week is what they normally would pay out right. in, in unemployment benefits. Right. Or 40, in, in my case, 47% of what we made before. Well, 44, 47% of my $2 and 13 cents is not worth me picking up the pen. When I saw this bill go down and they were like, well, this, and then it's going to be an additional $600 a week for people who are on un unemployment. I filed very quickly, <laughs> about, about as quick as you can imagine. To. Right. And so see some unemployment numbers rise very quickly because people are going, that was the biggest complaint that the, the, Demo the Republicans had was that people who are on unemployment now are going to be making more than they are at their jobs. They're not going to want to go back to work. You know, they're um, not going to go out and search for work because they're making more money by not doing that. Now this only lasts for yep. three months. Yes. So but uh, it, it basically you know. could turn into a three month easy vacation. I mean, yeah. I make more than Jamie and I, of course, between the two of us make more than $600 a week. But if we're paid $600 a week and just said, well, each. you know, you're just going to yeah. yeah each and then not go out. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll stay home. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's absolutely. So there is some incentivization there. But um, uh, what, what was it? We even saw our un unemployment claims. They, they went up 10, 10 times, right? And, I, and I'm one huge, of them. I'm yeah. part of the reason. It was like the, could... the largest unemployment filing change in one week to the next week that we've ever seen. Right. And we know that there's X amount of unemployed, but most of the time they don't collect these benefits. I, I right. usually don't. I mean, for me, I'm like, what, I'm going to be out of work for... I mean, I work at a buffet. I grant we're all hoping to be back by next Thursday. Sorry if you think that makes me a murderer. We've debated that in a different podcast already. But I'm hoping that we can be open soon, but maybe not, you know? And maybe if they keep us shut down, then yeah, this will kind of help keep us afloat. We need to do something the, to help keep us afloat. <laughs> and the other aspect of this too is that they're relaxing a lot of the unemployment requirements too. So it used to be you had to be uh, unemployed for a week before you could file. Then you had to uh, show that you have been going out and trying to find a job. You know, all that stuff's waived now. It's an immediate... Uh, as you lose your job, you can immediately file. And when, um, when you do, you don't have to show that you've been looking for work. Yeah. Right. So this is, so yeah, this is, this is a little bit different. It's exchanged things a little bit. I know I did see it did extend to people who are self-employed gig employers. Right. Um, yeah. If, if you are just, yeah, if you're a freelancer, this will apply to you. Um, there's some, Oh, I should should have read this a little bit better. There are some things it doesn't apply to. Um, 
that you know some types of work that it doesn't apply to but i think by and large you, you'll likely be covered for this if you're an unemployed to almost any degree you should be covered by this the trick is though you do have to file and so that is one of those things that if you haven't filed yet it's the department of workforce services you should file now i guarantee their servers will be overloaded because of this uh, if you have to call somebody or make questions you're going to want to do it now and be on hold for maybe three, four hours, then do it next week when everybody realizes there's an extra $600 weekly involved. Those hold lines are going to be a lot longer. Well, the, the people are going to show up and get in an actual line, which kind of defeats the whole purpose, but mm -hmm. <laughs> have to yep. do it all online or over the phone probably. But. Right, right. So the next big portion of this is the, uh, the large corporations, 500 billion. Um, there are some specifics on this. Uh, the, there is $425 billion that does not look like it is specific at all. So most of it is just give it out to big businesses that ask for it before you freak out too hard. Something you should know about the federal reserve, especially if you love economy, like I do, they, the, the way that most money gets into circulation is through a large business loan. It's not all of it, but when you see a number like this and you say, oh my gosh, can you believe it? Well, look, people like me, I think this is a bad way to have money in circulation, but this is what we've been doing since we adopted what the Keynesian equation, right? Like, like the 1950s, we've been doing this for a long time. So this is, this is something that, that is not exactly new um, to, to give this much out in terms of a large business loan. So what they will do, and this is, again, this is a pay for, this does have an offset, is they will give money to businesses at a very, very, very favorable rate, much more favorable than you could ever dream of. But it is a loan, it will have to be paid back to the Federal Reserve. Now, when you pay money to the Federal Reserve, you say, well, they aren't supposed to be making a whole lot of profit. They aren't completely nonprofit, they do pay like their salaries, but it's not some multi-billion dollar entity. Um, what this does is this actually gets money out of circulation that was into it before. So they, they give you this money, it's in circulation, they pay it back, that means it's out of circulation. So $500 billion for large businesses uh, helps them get ahead um, and, and get some really good, good economy going to uh, accomplish some new things. Almost all large businesses, it's funny, we've been talking about people's personal finances and small businesses, don't get me wrong, those people absolutely deserve to, be, to, deserve to be thought about and talked about. But almost every large corporation you can think of is operating on some kind of large loan. Now, you might say there's no way that this multi-billion dollar corporation is functioning on a loan. They probably are. Because the thing is, it is better for a McDonald's instead of saying, hey, save up and wait. And when you have the money, we'll build a store. It is far, far, far more profitable for them to say, open it now make the money and pay it back with a very low interest rate later, especially as that low interest rate approaches zero. Right now our prime is actually at zero. So, you know, you're looking at a very low, you know, fractional interest rate. It is much better for them to open now and be making money the entire time. Otherwise, the time in between when they've been saving money when they haven't been making any profit is much less than when they than if they'd been open the whole time and just pay a little bit extra in interest. So that is how the Federal Reserve operates. They always do this. This is nothing new other than it is a lot of new money all at once that they're asking them to pay. Um, before I get down into the nitty gritties of the large corporations, did you have anything on that, Reinhold? Well, there was, a, there was a sticking point on that whole thing too because the Democrats did not want them to give Steve the blank check. Here's $500, you go do whatever you think is right, right? They wanted some control over that so that they could say, Hey, companies can't use this for stock buybacks that's supposed to go to help employees. So they put some limitations in there. And one of the things they did do was they added in a inspector general. The inspector general is the one who's going to be responsible for handing out that information. And there's also going to be a um, committee uh, of various people uh, that are spelled out in there. A committee would be uh, providing oversight for that too, just to make sure that whoever the president appoints with Senate approval to be that uh, inspector general is, is following through on what they believe should be the, should be the uh, disbursement of that money. Right. Yeah. So there are some new, there's some new positions 
right or wrong. I mean, it, it's it's a it's one of those like I don't want government to expand, but if they must expand, another regulator is probably good for them. Yeah, you more know? inspector generals, more more uh, autonomous inspector generals as yeah. opposed to uh, swampy bureaucrats, right? <laughs> right, swamp rats. Yes, and I'm sure that I'm sure that somewhere in this bill, there's the creation of some more swamp rats too. I, I, we'll get to the state and local government spending in a minute here, but. Uh, there is the biggest portion of this um, that is non-controlled. So we have the $500 billion to large corporations. 425 is just going to go to large corporations in general. Specifically, the airlines are getting $58 billion. Um, uh, almost half of it, $25 billion, is going to be wages and benefits um, uh, for passenger plane uh workers cargo plane workers are getting another four billion contractors for airlines getting another three billion and then the largest which is, and this is always the one that scares me the single largest budget item for the airlines on this at 26 billion is other obviously they've incurred a lot of other expenses i'm not trying to demean what other means but usually when something is going wrong <laughs> with government other is where it's at uh in this case it's an airline it is a private business that is heavily government subsidized and they have a lot of government regulations. So you can kind of in your own head say how much of this is, do I consider it government or not? But it is $26 billion that is tabbed away that we don't, that we have guidelines of what to do with it, which is to spend it on the airlines. But whenever they let it be loose like that, you can almost assure that's where your, uh, what uh, $1,200 coffee mugs come from is the, the other spending that they're allowed to spend. So yeah, uh, yeah. go ahead. No, I'm just gonna say that's, that's how they do a lot of black spending is they'll just pay inflated prices then use that money for other real purposes that they're hiding, so. Yeah. Um, other nec uh, next biggest part of this with the large corporations is national security, $17 billion. Uh, that is technically a large corporation that is national security but it's going to uh, contractors um, that, that help with national security. And so that's another 17 billion for them. Of course, they are going, you know, you might look at this and say, weren't other, you know, why, why didn't you specify restaurants have been ha hit harder than airlines? Why don't you specify them? Why don't you get a big cutout for them like you do with national security? Well, Restaurants don't pay millions and millions of dollars in lobbying money every year. <laughs> and so they are going to be helped by this, but not as much as, I mean, who comes there's, first? The big yeah, guy. There's a restaurant right? association, mm -hmm. uh, but it has not got the power <laughs> that some of the other uh, special mm -hmm. interests might have. No, no. I think it, it's, uh, I forget the three, Lockheed Boeing and uh, the other one. There's three and they all pay roughly the same amount every year in, in, uh, I, I, it's uh, technically lobbying money. It, it's straight bribery, but there you go. That's a, that's a whole different rabbit hole. Uh, small business is the next largest increment. So individuals, 560 billion, large corporations, 500 billion, small businesses, 377 billion. Like the large corporations, this is in the form of loans, grants. There is some of this 17 billion, which is just loan relief. So we're not getting any of that money back. That's just 17 billion to help relieve small business loans, 10 billion in grants, and then uh, 350 billion, the bulk of it in new loans. So if uh, I know that my state, uh, before the government even acted, promised to help, I don't know if this will be included on the federal level or the state level that we'll get to in just a second, but, or, or if this will be consumed by that because it's pretty much the same thing, but if you have a small business and you look like you're going to go out of business, hey, I know what you really needed—a new loan. <laughs> you needed to—you need a new loan. Now, look, I get it. During this time, if you think you got to shut down, then you got to shut down. If that affects your business, health of people is always going to be more important than money because reputation is your currency, right? I, I've worked in the business world, especially the restaurant business world. I totally understand. However, also work in the restaurant business world, I understand that two, two weeks without income is not theoretically possible for pretty much 98% of all small businesses. There's no way you're going to survive two weeks not making money. Uh, unless it was planned like a vacation, that's just... <laughs> 
most of you small business owners here listening are get laughing when I even bring up the concept of a vacation. I get it. I've been there. It is hard. There is some loan here. It sucks that it's a loan. I believe that the, the, the terms are a little bit iffy, but it sounds like most of these are going to be 0% loans, which is just saying you have to pay it back. And I think there's some restrictions too on what they can use the loans for. Yes. Uh, Right, on what you're able to use it for. I know there's a lot, uh, payroll is the one thing they want you to use it for. But if you've achieved other losses, which most of you probably have other than just the loss of business and not being able to pay, pay your employees, you might be in some trouble. Um, get it hashed out. This is one of those things that we'll probably figure out in the upcoming days that I just did not have the time to read through the details on all. $350 billion worth of new small business and, loans. And speaking of that too, is that there, there was going to be a, a clause in there that stated that if you got a, a small business loan and you did not lay anybody off, then that loan could be turned into a grant. I don't know if that made it into the final bill yet. I haven't, I haven't looked at that section exactly and found that out. It's just, we're still trying to process. So uh, but I know that was something that was being floated around and I, and I know that it was something that was wanted in there. Got it. Good, good, good info. Uh, next biggest portion of this state and local government. Uh, they, they actually get into the decimals on this, but let's just go ahead and say $340 billion. Next biggest chunk. Still a pretty big chunk. Um, a huge bulk of it goes to the COVID-19 response to helping out the states However, they decided to help, whatever they, they decided to do with the COVID-19 response, it will be paid for in large part by the federal government or by the Federal Reserve. $274 billion of this is going to that. So out of $340 billion going to help state and local governments, $374 billion alone is solely dedicated to helping with whatever they decide to do. Now, much like the, this is very different than the, the last two we discussed. It's like the individuals, this is not money that's getting paid back. It's just money that's added to the system. You know, helping people out and, and, and uh, it, it's not going to be paid back. It's just saying, hey, state and local government, if you spent money, we will, get, we will cover that in trying to get the COVID-19 response it, whatever you decided to do, whether it be keep people in their homes and you incurred more police, you know, payments or, you know, whether, whether you had to, you know, ask for the National Guard for help, however you had to pay it, highway upkeep, I don't know what it might be, but there you go, $375 billion. Um, the other stuff in here, family programs, $5.3 billion. Higher education, fifteen billion. K through twelve skill schools, thirteen billion. Block grants, five billion dollars. A lot of schooling in there, twenty-five billion for them. This is something that the Democrats had lobbied hard, even if they weren't losing money, because the, usually tuition, especially if you are a state and local school, your tuition is tied heavily to property taxes and not actually attending school. It's not like if I don't attend for school for two weeks, I pay any less for that school. Right now, I rent a house out in Colorado. I, I, don't, I, I don't have any kids there, but I pay many, many thousands of dollars every year for any kid that I would have to go to school there. I will still pay that this year. So there's, there's some controversy around the schooling. Uh, but they always want to bail out. And of course, if you're going to get anything done in government, schools are usually the real hard one for Republicans to try and make a stand on <laughs> because people say these are the teachers and we love our teachers and uh, the schools don't always spend it on their teachers, but it is what it is. We haven't developed a sales pitch that really makes people get in check. And of course, Reinhold, I know you're going to love this one. Government other $29 billion. So I imagine that's money we just won't ever see again. <laughs> yeah, well, some of that's in, some of the stuff that that's uh, included into would be like, I think they're giving like 10, 10 million to the Senate's uh, staffing so they can pay for medical stuff for the Senate staffing and the Congress, same for them. And so there's just kind of some money floating around there for just government people to take care of their stuff too, as well for, for this, uh, this situation. Yep. That was, uh, that was, some oh, people have been calling that a pay raise. 
Oh, that okay. they claim that there was a pay raise for the congressman and Senate, but it is not true. It is not a t- it's not a pay raise. It's money going to pay for staff um, expenses for medical stuff and things like that. Money for more stuff. So because it would be unconstitutional for them to take any money for a pay raise until the next Congress come gets set. So and they'd never do anything unconstitutional. So yeah, you know, they don't. Want, they, <laughs> I don't think they wanted to take a chance on this bill getting thrown. Right. <laughs> Probably true. Uh, public health, the next biggest one, one hundred and fifty-four billion dollars. Uh, obviously, this is just we know what we're going to need. We need tests. We need uh, we need medicines that have shown to treat COVID nineteen, and we need and we need ventilators and we need masks and we need all that. And one hundred and fifty four billion dollars is going to this again. That will not be paid back. That's just one hundred and fifty four billion dollars into the economy. Uh, student loans. You've heard this was a big one. Um, We're getting kind of smaller now. I actually only have one thing after this, but uh, $44 billion into student loans or other. Um, Those uh, those loans have been ordered to make it postponed. There's some things that did make it, some things that didn't make it. So for example, making it illegal for your internet service provider to cut off um, service did not make it. So you can get cut off if you don't pay for for your internet or your TV or your phone. And then utility providers, at least on the federal level, are still allowed to cut off your utilities if you don't pay. That many, many states, they're regional. I know that they're government controlled monopolies, but they are regional. And some of them have said that they won't cut it off. And that's great, but there is no law making it illegal for there's, them to do There's it no off. federal law right now. I think some of the states yeah. are putting something into play for that. Co- but... right. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's regional. It's funny because I was in Colorado as Rocky Mountain, I think Rocky Mountain Electric, and I'm here in Utah, it's still Rocky Mountain Electric that I have to pay. But yeah, so, so it, it varies. I know it's various monopolies, but at the moment they are able to cut it off if they want you to. However, the loans, the federal student loans, there is going to be a moratorium on those. They will be 0% while you're not paying them off, not forever, uh, for a little bit. And that is, that is how they are operating. That's how they're operating all of that. Yeah, they're basically allowing them to, to, to bypass having payments for a period of time. You can still make payments mm-hmm. if you want to continue doing so. Uh, they won't be accruing interest during that time. So you can pay, actually pay down... If you make your payments, you're paying a lot more on the principal, which is a good thing to do. I mean, if, if you have the funds and you have the ability to do that, uh, don't just stop paying them because uh, you don't have to. You can actually knock down a, a good chunk of debt doing that. So, Awesome. And this last part here, and I think this, this is kind of a nice segue from taking us to the details of the bill to the philosophy awesome. behind the bill. The safety well, I got some net. fun fine print too. So. Oh, you do? Okay. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, yeah, but this is a good segue here. The uh, $26 billion for, a, for the safety net. If you wonder what that is, that's child nutrition, SNAP, food banks. There is a $1.25 billion for safety net other. But when you're looking at kind of welfare services that are kind of outside the purview of simple social security or simple, you know, um, unemployment, when you look at that other safety stuff, that's $26 billion. So what other tidbits did you have in this bill before we, uh, before we move on from that? Uh, so one of the fun ones is there is a bill, in, there's a section in here dedicated to corruption in Congress as or corruption in government. Um, conflicts of interest is what it's called. So section 4019 of the bill. Um, and it basically states that um, certain top uh, officials are not allowed to benefit in any way uh, okay. from the emergency aid, right? Um, it lists specific people who are included. This includes the president, vice president, members of Congress, top executive branch officials. And it also adds any spouse, child, son-in-law, or daughter-in-law of any said individual that's listed. Um, a lot of people are pointing out that that's probably specifically to target Jared Kushner as oh, okay. the son-in-law of Trump. Okay. Um, so that's why they added in those that specific language, I believe. So 
Got that it. was one of the things that uh, the Republicans were trying to fight on and the Democrats have insisted on and the Democrats won on that. Well, they wouldn't spend government money on personal stuff, right? Like trying to like buy books to make it not. look like they're doing better or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, this is unfortunately you have to put it in there. Like it's just one of those things where you say like it seems like a joke because you're like, well, nobody would do this. Now there's some cases, and and I bring this up all the time with the ACA. I mean, they didn't even pretend for some of that stuff. It was money that went to a a, a hospital that didn't exist or a district that didn't exist. Or went to, or, you know, or went to somebody's it, wife who runs a company. You yes, know. and it wasn't yeah. it wasn't very well hidden. But the thing mm-hmm. is, is we needed it. We wanted it passed and we had to, the thing is we didn't need We'd it. We'd find so out that, about it after it passed. Like, right. But there wasn't line. some kind of national emergency. They just right. really wanted it. They had control of the House and Senate and White and House. You don't get that kind of opportunity. Because they, yeah, they squeaked that through, mm-hmm. remember. It, yep. There were Democrats voting against that and there were some Republicans that had to be swayed to vote for it. And that's the result of that. A lot of people were basically paid off. Right. To get it through. The Cornhusker kickback, which I think actually didn't even make it to the final bill. <laughs> but uh, Ben Nelson, uh, yeah, nuked his whole career based on taking that bribe. Um, and, and so there's a, at the moment, it looks like there's a lot less blatant bribery here. And in fact, with right. stuff like you said, they actually took mm-hmm. some steps to make sure that these couldn't become bribes. It's an emergency situation, well, you know. Try, but, they try, try. their best. Whether they it's try. Gonna work or not. There's still other related expenses, which I always get scared about. And sometimes those business loans, and I could talk about the Fed, and it's the problems I have with the Fed are unending. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people that said to be a libertarian, all you have to be is anti war, anti Fed. I totally disagree. However, I do think anti Fed is a really good starting point. <laughs> it, it is, it, there's huge problems with it. And we know there's problems with it. And the bottom line is it's the government is using it as a tool and people will love to say, well, you know, they're a totally separate entity. Yeah. Government created them and government staffs them, but they're a separate entity. Well, then they pass a bill like this that says, Hey, you need to print this amount of money and it's up to you to get it back. You know, like, you know, in the stuff that there's a loan, you can get it back. Well, what if we fail to get it back? Cause uh, a lot of times this happens. We, we, they're authorized to do a certain amount in business loans you know, and these loans that they're supposed to get back because they put a lot of money in, they need to take a little money or even more money out of circulation when they do that. And yeah, they Solyndra say, well, what a good example. Yeah. Cylindra, great example. Uh, yeah. well, you know, and, 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 and in, in some cases, not even corruption, you give it out to a company yeah. that doesn't make it. I mean, that just happens. Right. And in this case, unfortunately, yeah, yeah they're the fed, the federal reserve, they distribute money to banks and that is largely how they operate is through banks but they of themselves are not a bank. And so when somebody can't pay back, they really don't have to care because, because there's, they can say, well, we were supposed to try to get this much back. We didn't. There's just that much more money out in the economy and that helps contribute to the inflation. The Federal Reserve is absolutely why costs grow not at the rate of pay. They could... In the case of like the libertarian case for UBI, they could just take money that they're going to add. There's no reason for it to be a loan to begin with, mind you. In fact, if they're the sole distributor of currency into the system, it makes no sense to do it as a loan. Because if you, if you have all the money in the world, you say, I give out all the money in the world and I have it and I'm supposed to distribute it. And I have, let's say it's $20 and I have some family, I have five family, family members. I give each of them $4 now. And I say, well, I need you to each give me $5 later. That amount of money doesn't exist. You gave out your $20. There's only $20 in the system. So you already know as soon as you've given out the money, you're not going to get $25 back. You see what I'm saying? Does this make mm-hmm. sense? There's not that amount of money in the system. That is the problem with the Federal Reserve. If you And, and this is a problem that we've had with Reserve banking since, I mean, we're talking medieval times. This has been a problem. And uh, it's important to learn this when you look look at like why Hitler kind of got upset with the banks. No, Hitler has no validity, but I want you to understand like what that riff is about when he says- What that situation was put in place that created the environment for somebody like Hitler to take over. Yes. 
and 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 he and he feasted off that anger to kill Jews, of course. And so that's the problem: is you have a legitimate problem, and then when government tries to make a solution, sometimes they don't they don't do so well on the solution. And, and of course, the consequences. And there's also a thing called moral hazard that we're ignoring with this with this uh, type of stimulus or bailout as well. So, yep. uh, we saw that with the 2008 bailout where they said, okay, this is like a one-time thing. We're only doing it because it's an emergency. Um, you guys need to take care of yourselves next time. We're not going to do it. And then the next time it happens, we do it. So companies never learn to prepare for this stuff or, or uh, be in a specific financial footing to handle something like this uh, because they've been told they're going to get bailed out by the Fed no matter what happens. They're too big to fail. Right, so bingo. you eliminate all moral hazard from any decisions they make then they're not going to make the right decisions. So, Exactly. And the thing is, is they can theoretically operate just fine. So money that's added is supposed to reflect value that's added. Money supply is supposed to grow. When we look at real, this is kind of was Mises was his bread and butter. Whenever you hear somebody talk about, you know, Mises it is monetary supply and it is supposed mm -hmm. to grow. The population grows. There needs to be more money. The value of life grows. There needs to be more money. Of course, I get that. Money should always be getting added to the system based on these things. The trouble is it's not added based on those things. And to further prove that it's not added based on those things, we will grow the economy by four tri you know, trillion dollars a year. And they won't add four trillion dollars in hey, it, you added $4 trillion to the economy, here's $4 trillion. They'll say, here's $4 trillion in the form of a loan. Well, the problem is, is the value has already been added to the economy. So it makes more sense to do this. They could do this just in kind of a UBI type of situation. Everybody gets the money. We have to have the, we need this amount of money in circulation. Why not just give it out? Why do they only give it to these businesses? And why do they only do it in the form of a loan? In the sense that even these big crony businesses that are doing unethically incorrect things, they are still kind of have a gun to their head because the only way they're getting that money is to take this loan. It's not coming out for free. And, and so this, this is the problem that we have with the Fed all of the time. It is more of that same problem. I don't want to make it look like a new problem was created with this bill but it is more of the same, the same problem. Yeah, it's just the same we've always seen. It's just going to continue because nobody's stopping it. Uh, right. and, and the thing is, too, is that in the middle of an, uh, a situation like this, isn't the time to, that a lot of people are going to be willing to or have the, uh, the fortitude to get together and do some, stop it because there's people suffering out there right now. We want to help. I believe 96-0 um, yeah. was how it got passed. 96-0. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, they were, I don't know if it, it was 96-0 on the Senate, on the House. I don't know if... Uh, there was one no vote. It was it was a voice vote, so it's hard to say. Oh, for real? Yeah. They, oh. So yeah, they wanted to. They wanted Massey wanted to stop it, so it was a recorded vote. Yes. So he put in a motion to make it a recorded vote instead of just a voice vote, mm -hmm. and he could not get a second. So all of it, it stopped a forty three seconds of delay into getting the bill passed. Let, I, let me put a pin on it because we should talk about Massey for just a second since we're on the subject. But I do want to let you finish your why it's not popular right now. Yeah, list. A and, and the whole list well, of everything we've got with the bill. Yeah, but. this is just some of the fun fine print things like um, there's temporary tax break for makers of hand sanitizer in here. Yeah. So apparently if you uh, make like, let's say you make 100,000 gallons of, of a hand sanitizer, you're paying up to $13 a gallon in tax on that. So that was the biggest detriment that people were having with making the hand sanitizer, making sure we had enough of it as they were getting hit by it pretty hard on taxes. So they put in a, um, a tax break basically for them for the period for the next three months to uh, not have to pay those taxes. Um, okay. <laughs> postal service gets special yeah. loan help. Now, a lot of people are complaining about the postal service getting help. There are some caveats to what has been going on here that kind of makes it less concerning. Um, but, you know, they are doing less delivering of mail right now. So they are taking a hit on that as, as well, that the money that's they're going to be allowed to borrow, it's a loan. It's not going to be given just to them. Um, the money that they're going to allow to borrow can only pay for those things to help keep them afloat for operation costs. It cannot be used to pay off past loans or anything like that. They're not getting any forgiveness on any past loans or anything. So it's just to um, get them going. And the part of the 
caveat to that is that they are now being ordered to prioritize delivery of any medical products that come through the mail. So they're saying the government's saying, we want you to prioritize this mail. We're going to help you out on operation costs in order to keep you floating through this period of time. So those, those medical uh, stuff, the medical products can still flow. Right. They force um, you to you do additional priority mail. It makes sense that, yeah. that that's more expensive. So they're yeah. helping pay. So they're going to, but they're, but they're saying they can't use it to pay off of the loans or anything like that. So that's really what it's for. Yeah. And, and not to be defensive of the post office here, they're poorly operated. They have a lot of problems, but I think with the issue with the post office, when everybody says, well, they need to close some, sure, but not mine, please. <laughs> not, not my local one, please. You know, and, and uh, they are heavily subsidized. And so sometimes you do see the, you can expect some increased costs when something is subsidized, when you get rid of the subsidy. Now you will, as with the case of all subsidies, it will make up for it in the grand scheme of things. But, you know, do you want that kind of turmoil right now? You know, there will be some disruption. Now, I, I believe me, I, being, being the one true libertarian, I'm ready for the turmoil, but I understand why other people aren't. <laughs> well, and, yeah, and, and the thing is, is that the majority of people are the ones who make the decisions, right? So um, and we have to kind of convince them. And you're not going to do that in the middle of this type of situation. But um, it's something I think we need to focus on after when we are in the good times. And I think libertarians try to do that. But the problem is then is that things are great. Why are we going to mess with it? You know, we've been saying for years, hey, this economy is supposedly so great that we should be paying back some of this debt um, so that we are in a better position in case some emergency comes up that we can have to deal, dip back into. And everybody's like, nah, we just keep going like we are. And, yeah. you know, it's where we're at now. It's what, it's, this, is, this is the reason why we were saying that. And now that this has happened, we have a better story to go back and say, look, now that things are better, let's get this stuff fixed. Yeah. So I do have yeah. one more Hit it. fine printy thing. Yeah. Um, and this is another one that the uh, Republicans are a little upset about. Uh, they got pushed in there because the Democrats. So we, we, we kind of talked off offline before about the Pelosi bill. We talked about that last uh, ah. two nights ago. Um, the reason she did that was to get them because they were balking on a lot of stuff that their Democrats wanted. So she put out that bill to say, hey, look, you know, it could be worse. <laughs> and so they kind of caved a little bit on some of this stuff. What a way to save insider um, trading. <laughs> but one of the things listed here is um, a caveat. So not too long ago, uh, the president uh, issued uh, an executive order that basically stated that no federal money could go to any sanctuary cities. Uh, this bill has a provision in there that says he cannot do that for this money. Right? Oh, so nice. I think they okay. were wanting to, they were wanting to say, Hey, you know, this is federal money. It's supposed to be given out, but you're a sanctuary city. We're not going to give it to you. They wanted to do that. The Democrats stopped them. Well, I don't often enjoy what the Democrats do, but mm -hmm. uh, in, in this case, yeah. Yeah. If you're deporting people in the middle of this F you, I mean, I just, yeah. yeah. Get, if you're the one posing as a doctor to bust some family yeah, if, that needs a if you're doctor telling us this home. is this emergency is so great that we have to make people stay home from work and we have to spend all of this money or everything's going to just collapse you've got bigger important things to worry about than whether some guy is a few weeks past on his stupid uh application visa you know right and it's so it's elitist so like like for me yeah. it's so elitist to be able to be like we're in the middle of this crisis i know everybody but we're going to go door to door and bust all those illegal immigrants now, because now we can actually catch them at home. You, you know what, what I mean? Rhode Just, Island's doing? Mm -mm. They're going door to door to find any New Yorkers and quarantining <laughs> them. <laughs> It's just some like, are we? Are they like re, re like reigniting like that New England New York they, feud or whatever? No, they're going they're going door to door with National Guard to houses that may have New York people living there or staying there, and they're going to identify if they're there and they're going to quarantine them. Oh my gosh! Okay, <laughs> well, just utter madness, just utter madness. Yep. So what did uh so let's let's talk about Massey for just a second. I find that the story is very simple and easy to talk about, and I guess I don't really get triggered one way or another, but a lot of people do. So um, I believe he uh, he proposed that we should um, have to all have a physical vote for this, which means showing up. Put your name vote, on a vote for it. Well, and, and the other thing put is your putting your name on. down. Yeah, right. That was the putting, big one. putting your name down, sign it, say hey, I stand by this, you know, or I don't. 
and he received no second. So I, I did color this, chalk this up to something I learned today. I guess you need a second to make a, a motion like that. Nobody so, else made the motion. The, yeah, the, if you haven't been motion. to a Libertarian Party convention. I have not. And Robert's Rules and other things like that. It's, it's pretty interesting, all the things you have to go through. But there is, there is a rule that you have to have any motion that's been offered has to be seconded by someone else in order for it to be voted on by the body. Right. So that was one of the um, fun things about the last convention. There's a, a person named Aaron Starr who uh, went and was trying to, we were coming back in from a lunch break or something like that. And he didn't think there was enough people in there for a quorum. So he went to uh, make star work and said, you know, got on the mic and said, Hey, I don't think there's a quorum here. I'm wait. I think we should wait until everybody gets here. And there was some back and forth between that. And finally, um, Nick says, are you, are you challenging my decision that I think that there's enough in here? And he said, yes, I am. So he said, anybody want to second it? And there was no second because people were sitting at the mic yelling at him, just, just shut up and keep going because everybody was just wanting to get moving forward with business. So, um, that's, that's something that, uh, that can happen. So it, it prevents dilatory, um, prevention of the rules to be followed. Right. So it, he could have, if he had done that, he didn't need a second. This could have delayed for weeks, you know, right. depending on how, how long he wanted to go with that. So there's a thing called dilatory um, actions. And this was one of those things that um, require a second for that. So. Yeah. Uh, and should have thought about that ahead of time. I got somebody on his side. Well, and, and maybe it was just for show. I mean, ultimately I think oh, yeah, it was yeah. because there were zero no votes. So even he did not vote. No, I believe well, he was we don't probably... know if there was no, we don't know. It was, it was unanimous consent by voice approval. Right. So... But, but because it was unanimous, we know he didn't say no. Right. So, I mean, if you really want to take a stand, he may, you say he no. may have said, he may have said no when they said any nays, he may have said nay. Uh, but because it was approved to be a unanimous consent vote and the A's had it, then that was considered unanimous consent vote. So they didn't need, so because they started with the I's, right. they never went to the nays. So we don't know if those other four would have. No, they, they did go to the nays because the nays could have been louder. So okay. it's, it's by voice vote. So they could say, okay, whether or not, it's not like where they stand and say, I, 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 oh. it's, it's mass, you know, the, you know, all those in favor say I, I, all those in favor say nay yeah and then you determine who had the who has more people on right. your so, side so maybe he just needed more volume okay got it <laughs> well all right so but but in all likelihood it appears that only four people were unheard and did not vote either way or whatever the they case did. i don't think be. they showed up i think they were in ice quarantine or isolation or something okay so i i guess for me like if, if i was looking at somebody who really wanted to disrupt the system i mean you, you i guess not voting no wouldn't have mattered i guess you'd be overwhelmed but i don't know i think for me that says more to me than like hey can we do this and can we write our names down on this you know that type of thing yeah i, mean, I, I guess i, I, I get the, I get the reason been, for it now i think a I think a recorded vote should have been called the problem was is he was trying to call that there wasn't a quorum which is a little bit different because there are a lot of people who i mean the house had kind of said, okay, we're adjourned for business for a while. And now they're rushing back to try to get there to, to, for their vote yep. because they knew they had enough people that were going to vote for it. A lot of them were just like saying, ah, we'll just let them vote with what they have, but you have to have a quorum. And that's what he was trying to do was force a quorum vote in order to ensure that enough people were there okay. to uh, accurately uh, represent the people that they're supposed to be representing. Gotcha. It was small. It was a hiccup. Yes, it's a, I guess it's a hiccup that if it got seconded, could have, like you said, delayed it for weeks. It didn't happen. Uh, it delayed it for, I believe, all of 43 seconds is what I heard. 43 seconds. 43 seconds. Somebody, somebody on Twitter said, hey, quit talking about his sex life. And so, Don <laughs> and so Donald Trump, of course, immediately comes back with, uh, this guy hates the Second Amendment. Thank goodness he got overruled. Um <laughs> This is the person this, who uh, made bump messy. stocks illegal and who said he was going to uh, right. take the guns first, right? That's right. that's the person who's calling Massey, who is pictured in fo footage with you know shooting guns. Oh yeah, he's, the guy's he's holding like an AK forty seven. Like yeah. I mean, he's like he's super pro gun. Like that's, it's that's the like, uh, that's the environment we live in right now. 
Like, oh, I guess because you wanted to delay a vote for 43 seconds, you must hate gun owners. Like, <laughs> shut up, dude. Like, it, it just made no sense. That, like, I, I get if you disagree with Massey, but, like, the clapback from Trump is like, what? Like, this is just being goofy, man. Like, well, I, wor- I worse was John Kerry agreed with Trump on it. Oh, yeah. And was calling him a... Uh, a mass hole is what he called him. Yeah. Do you see guy? Oh yeah. Do you, well, he called him an asshole and a mass hole. Guilty yeah. of being an asshole. Hashtag mass hole. Yeah. You know what? Honestly, it, it, Republicans, if you're out there, like just think about it for a moment that Donald Trump and John Kerry are in agreement on something. Maybe, maybe you've lost grips on what it means to be a Republican. If it means ever agreeing with John Kerry, I have a lot of things that I regret in my life. I worked on judge W Bush's campaign. I wish I did not. However, I do not regret for one second, any of the bad things I said about John Kerry, the dude deserved what he got. And uh, yeah. I, I, and so with Trump and Kerry kind of in the same <laughs> swift boat on this one, it makes uh it, it, it makes Massey look like he, you know, he was the one. He, he's the thorn in he's the, the, sane the one, yeah. <laughs> He's the thorn, right? I mean, for me, he looks sane. It makes it, you know. But of course, you know, when when finally we get all this bipartisanship, right? We got Democrats saying Trump's finally being a leader on this. We got it's, Trump's here's Trump the thing. saying these guys are whenever fine. whenever there's bipartisanship to this degree, we're getting screwed, and we know it. Always has been that way. I hate bipartisanship <laughs> on on principle you know to just say they're in that party i'm in this party because it creates tribalism or, or i guess i hate no anti-bipartisanship i guess yeah. that's what i'm saying but when it, but but whenever we actually get part whenever they actually come together it's over something really bad but here it is here we are i'm not saying I, the government caused this and i guess this is where we segue into the philosophy the government said or i guess nobody caused it it's a virus these things happen in nature right unless you want to look at that Wuhan facility they, and maybe they were what, doing something there, but yeah, what they did was <laughs> they conspiracy. created the situation where it made it harder for us to respond ag- adequately to yes. this happening. Yes. They created many difficulties and I'm talking about governments all over the world. I mean, you, the U S obviously, I mean, we were, we were talking about whether, you know, gun owners have mental illness and then it's like, Oh wait, an actual illness crap. Now and we were we were doing other stuff at this time. We just talked about the hand sanitizer tax, the overbearing yep. tax on that that keeps too much hand hand sanitizer from being made. Well, now we need a bunch of hand sanitizer and nobody's got an incentive to do it. So right. We we uh, fix that. Man, the medical industry, if you've ever worked there, you know you are familiar with this. You likely have a machine in your hospital that is only the only machine for X amount of distance. The way they regulate this is they say, Well, if you have a say a CAT scan, there's three allowed per every hundred miles, or so in some cases, only one allowed. And, and for, you know, and th- this is just big pieces of equipment. They are very regulated that way. You're not allowed to have them in other places. So the free market would, was, is over here being like, oh, these respirators aren't even all that expensive. We can make a billion of them. And the government up to this point has said, well, no, you have to limit yourself. Otherwise, you're going to start stepping on people's toes. And we have this nice organized medical system. We don't want Dyson, cheap medicine. Dyson said he's, re- he's re-engineered and made a new one. And he's making it available. And he's got like 75,000 ready to go or something like that. So Right. And so we have better mousetraps being made as we speak because they finally decide to be like, oh, maybe that was, maybe we should temporarily, of course, lift these restrictions. And, and so, not be go- so authoritarian. Right. So when we want to fix things, we got to be not as authoritarian as when things are not being falling apart. So right. it might tell you something about how, how well authoritarianism reacts to crisis. I, I think for me, this whole thing is just reaffirmed libertarian values Mm -hmm. in that sense and and there is some cases where i say you want people to be smart they're not quarantining they're not being smart i understand there's some there's the the gut reaction to this was a very non-libertarian one even in our chat and i think everybody's chat if you're the one libertarian they're like hey you idiot you know this virus is destroying your entire philosophy i think the article written was there's no there's no libertarians in a crisis or something like that and i'm like mm-hmm. something incredibly yeah. stupid but then you look at it and what does the government do when they say oh there's a real problem we better get the market going on it <laughs> we better let you guys actually take care of it it's yeah, the ex- how, yeah, exact opposite companies are calling us up 3m's calling us up to help and all these yep. companies are calling us up to do things and 
that's the free market taking care of it. They're just trying to coordinate through a central point. That central point does not have to be government. Yep. At all. And, and the, if it uh, wasn't. <laughs> I, I was so inspired with uh, Ryan and Andrew sharing their stories about helping the homeless and, and that thing going on in LA where they've had the funding for the homeless shelter that they just never got around to building. And then there's a bunch of volunteers that are like, hey, let's help these homeless in the meantime. And they finally, the government is like, well, I guess they need help. We'll temporarily let you help them. We'll temporarily let this building be done. You were supposed to have this done. It's not a matter, here's the thing, it's not a matter of if the government can make the right decision. They absolutely could. It's theoretically possible. They just don't. And so that's, the whole thing is incentive. I think what people see, because I don't, I, I don't like the whole Republicans and Democrats are all stupid. That's a bad way to dialogue with Republicans and Democrats. Most of the time they see some element of government and see that thing as a necessity and say, I want that thing done. Well, if you want that thing done, don't you think other people want that done too? Government has always been a, done a terrible job of executing good things. And the cost of them executing those good things poorly is also adding a, pun, a ton of bad things that they're actually pretty good at doing, right? And so th th that's kind of the, the, the double-edged sword here is you see the power of them being capable of handling something fairly correctly um you, you know they when you have that amount of power you have the power to do things correctly the only issue is is that they don't did they have the power to do something about this epidemic that would have been responsible fair would have taken into account your human right as well as other people's rights to live they absolutely had that power i don't think there's any doubt about it i mean they're proving it right now they can keep whole cities in their homes and keep you from leaving and shut down your business and shut down your church and if you have that kind of power you get you get the power to do anything i mean printing money into the economy what power don't you have they had all the power in the world and they just botched it and this is case in point what libertarians have been saying for years they that the government does bad does good things badly and does bad things really well and the coronavirus is just the epitome of that and this is this is something that we look at this government created a problem what's their solution kind of a crappy thing we got to print a whole bunch of money off um we can get in the weeds on if it's socialism or not i mean having a centralized federalized system kind of makes it more fascist than socialist but it's all bad i mean it, it it's it, it's not good and is it a problem? It, it's, it's something that might be necessary, unfortunately, because of the situation that they created to begin with. When you have this type of economy, I think a lot of Americans need this type of solution. They put me out of work. I would be in trouble if it wasn't for the help of some of my family and friends. I received some of that help from my family and friends, so I am okay, but not everybody has that. And it's just, it, and so it's one of those things that, that if the government is going to put you out of work forcibly, then they need to be responsible for cleaning up their mess. Unfortunately, cleaning up their mess is going to hurt a lot of people. Your children are going to have to pay more because we printed up all this money. You are in the immediate aftermath gonna have to pay more because there's more money now in the supply. Loans are gonna come out. Guess what? When you go to a small business and they've taken an additional loan to stay up front, what do you think happens to the cost? When they, you know, to stay up front, stay afloat. When they have to take a loan to stay afloat, what do you think happens to the cost of purchasing from that small business? What do you think happens to the wages of the employees who work at that business? What do you think especially happens to the wages of that owner when they have to take out another loan? All government solutions are gonna hurt somebody. We can argue about it being ne necessary right now or not based on the situation that they've created, but this is kind of case in point for why we need to not be in this situation, I feel. That is my rant. Reinhold, you've earned some speaking time. Well, I mean, I, just, I agree on that. The, the whole point of good government would be to put us in a situation so we can be healthy to respond properly to some sort of uh, situation like this, right? So some sort of uh, emergency catastrophe, something unknown, unseen. And, and you're told that, you know, by people who are trying to teach you to, to be more financially secure, you, they say you should have two months salary put in the bank. You should have prepared for not having, you know, any job for two months or uh, make sure you have food stocks and things like that, just to prepare yourself for stuff like that. And nobody would follow it. You know, look how, look how this is going on. Right. Uh, well, the government needs to learn that same lesson, right? We, er, we've been talking about for years about 
how the new thinking is that debt's cool. That's good. That that's a good thing that we have debt. And I'm like, the problem with that is that you're putting yourself at a uh, razor thin line uh, that a lot of companies will work, try larger companies will try to run as well, but they put them in a razor thin line and then something comes up, they can't respond. They can't do anything about it. Uh, so we still have to pay certain, the, the interest on the debt that we're paying. So that's money we still have to pay. Uh, if imagine if we didn't have to pay that right now, right? We would have money that we could be using for this purpose. We could have money we weren't taking from people anymore so that they could be preparing themselves for such a situation, uh, which, you know, now we've just got people basically just living on the edge for years because these, the, the great economy is a razor thin one that most people are living paycheck to paycheck. Oops, here's something that happens. And now nobody can deal with it. Everybody, you know, women show, there have been people who've been told they can't work for a couple of weeks. And there are, there's people out there who are like, I don't know how I'm going to eat yeah. just because of two weeks, just two weeks of not having a job. And it's like, you know, even if not even taking into account all the bills they have, but just not having any money at all. And it's like that most people are like that, not because they're just irresponsible, but they're just barely getting by because we're taxing people so much in order to pay a debt for the good times that we had years ago. So now somebody's going to be taxed to pay for this situation and we're going to tax someone else to pay for their situation when they have it. Right. Eventually you got to get ahead of it or you're just going to not be a country anymore. I think libertarians are oftentimes guilty of going after you brought this up and I, I think it's an important point that we are guilty of going after the highest fruit on the tree. Now we should go eventually get after all of it. And I think that we will eventually want an explanation for how schooling is taken care of and, and medicine is taken care of. And, and those are ones that people kind of don't want you to touch right now, uh, regardless of whether of how necessary it is, they're very necessary for the private sector to take care of, but people are ready for it right now. So instead of bashing your head and trying to make them there, let's talk about the things they are ready for. Um, war is not really popular. Um, uh, uh, subsidies going to multi, multi million dollar companies. I, 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 I read this and I couldn't believe it, but I guess over half of farm subsidies go to farms owned with the last name either Turner or Rockefeller. I mean, they, we, we subsidize millionaires. <laughs> billionaires. We subsidize billionaires to help us grow our crops. And if you get rid of just uh, those types of things, you balance the budget. Right now, we are like on yearly, like at a deficit of $1.2 trillion a year. And like you said, we even if we don't get rid of everything that libertarians or anarchists want to and just downsize the entire thing, we'd be way better prepared at this type of thing if we weren't spending this money on... And I'm not talking about eliminating the whole military. I'm just saying the that let, let, let's go for the low hanging fruit first. Let's talk about the stuff when the military spends. Uh, I, they were the ones, the Department of Defense, that spent the 1,200 on coffee mugs that I talked about, and then bought a, a whole bunch of them. Now they probably didn't actually spend it; they just had to spend it, or else they don't get that in their next budget. If we stop them, or somebody stop them from doing that type of thing, that's money that we have not money that we don't have. Again, I'm aware that the Federal Reserve makes this a problem because they do not put money in the system that isn't lent out. So we, even if we execute it perfectly, we will always be owing money and that needs to be looked at too. But I can't think of a single person that wants the Fed to lend all of their money instead of just giving it out. Now, if, if it must exist at all, obviously, end the Fed, right? That's the Ron Paul thing. That's how people, a lot of people came to libertarianism. You know, we talk about ending the Fed. But if you're not ready to end the Fed, at least change the terms of the Fed. Make it the so problem, that they're, stop yeah, lending. One of, the problems, yeah, one of the problems with the Fed is that, and there's a great documentary on, on it's called uh, Money for Nothing Inside the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve. But one of the things that was interesting was that they were able to use monetary policy in order to prevent runaway inflation. And then in the 70s, they were tasked with their, while we were trying to eliminate poverty, they were tasked with um, also you need to um, make sure that unemployment stays at a certain level. Well, the problem is that the things you do to regulate inflation have an opposite effect on what you do to regulate 
unemployment, right? So there's a stop, basically a stop button and a go button or a pedal if you want to, like a car. So, right. you know, you, you're, you're basically, what we're doing now is we're riding the brakes while pushing down the gas to try and make it just right in that little sweet spot. And when you're riding in that little sweet spot for too long, you're going to blow out everything. Right. I mean, this is, I mean, you've kind of given a great analogy for how bubbles happen, right? There's, mm-hmm. a, there's a cost that we feel is right for your housing to be. And then when the market says something else, or, or not even the market, when just something happens that makes it so that less people are seeking home ownership or more people are seeking home ownership, you take your little nice car that's at that right speed that you want and you either rip off the brake pedal or you rip off the accelerator and something crashes through the windshield or crashes into the wall in front of you you know mm-hmm. and, and and this is just how all of these bubbles happen by saying we've forced it to be a certain thing and we feel that that's the right thing for most people and and, and maybe they're right maybe they're wrong maybe you think housing is where it should be right now but ultimately the market doesn't want it there and you need to let the market shift the Fed does not like that shifting stuff. They everybody talks we, about this. They want to see stocks gradually increase. The little mouse steps always seen, up. We have not seen this market free to operate as a market since nine eleven. Uh, and I'm before like, then, it was iffy. But I mean, so you know, Volcker did a great job in getting us back on track after the. Um, the great stagflation of the seventies, right? So Volcker came in and he says, I don't care if interest rates go to 15%, 20%, we're going to do what we need to do. And it's going to, we're going to ride it out and we're going to get ourselves back in financial uh, stability. And they didn't realize that the interest rate was going to go to 23%, 25%. I mean, it did. Yeah. And people were upset. There were people who couldn't build homes anymore because nobody wanted to buy homes. And, and they were mailing bricks in protest to the, to the white house. And he stuck his guns out and by 1984, we had gotten our financial situation so well done uh, that Reagan won in a landslide, yeah. right? Uh, all because things were finally getting better. From the, the 81, 82 was just rough, 80, 81, 82, uh, because of that. But he, he, did the, he did the work that needed to be done so that the future generations could be absolved of having to pay for all of that. So yeah. we took care of it. We resolved it. Uh, we fixed the problem from the seventies and the eighties and then things got away again because, you know, they, that's, there's no, there was nobody else to stand up and say, no, we're going to take this on yeah. and, and be responsible. We're just going to pass it on to our kids. Right. Well, and it, and it is very, uh, I think doing the right thing is oftentimes chaotic. And like you said, uh, uh, he had to do something that was, kind of counter counterintuitive to what a lot of people wanted him to do, but it ended up being the right thing. Now, one person should probably not have that volume of control. I, I know for me, I looked at his, the history of the prime rate when I went into lending, because I was like, it's always somewhere between one and 5%, you know, like, like what's the point in even, you know, it'll be a big deal when it goes up to 3.3 or big deal. It goes, and then I look back in, and I was born in 84 and I look back in uh, uh, Carter years, right. It was like 77, 78, 79. And it was at like 72%. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. You're telling me if I had a hundred dollars in a savings account for one year, it'd be $172 at the end of the year. And they're like, yeah, that's right. That, that was true for a little while in time. And I'm like, wait a minute, you're also telling me if I had a loan for $100, I would owe $172 by the end of the year? Yeah, that's true. I'm like, dude, that is bananas. Like, I can't even imagine that. I think most people couldn't even fathom something like that. Well, and think about it, with with that situation, though, you have much better flexibility to have larger GDP increases. We had mm-hmm. much bigger GDP increases. Uh, everybody talks about all the GDP is going up 2%, 3%. This is really great. Like, yeah, we used to have seven, 8%. I don't know right. what happened there, you know, uh, because it, it was money was freed up because things were more financially stable and there were, yeah. there were chances to save. You could save money. Right. Uh, there was a dis- disincentive to borrow too much money. Now there's no disincentive to borrow money and there's mm-hmm. no incentive to save it. To save it. So Absolutely. Guess what happens? Everybody's, everybody's working on credit. I mean, your average, what, I even had this pulled up in the other thing. Uh, average debt per citizen, 63000 Average saving per family, 15000 And debt per citizen is 63000 I mean, that includes like kids and stuff. I mean, <laughs> they're in debt before they're born. You know, it, it, it's just one and of those things of that we... How much is that is the national debt that we yeah. are putting on those kids too? 
we'll now, just if add another six thousand dollars on that. Yeah. Right. If you're big about the logistics of like Austrian economics, there is a time for lending and there is a <laughs> time for saving. And what he and you know what some people have to do is say you know it's savings time, it's lending time. But no one person actually has to make that decision. The way markets kind of work themselves out when you look at that stock market, I think it's funny that people freak out when stocks go so far down because our economy is hurt. Well, that's the time when you, average Joe, can start affording these stocks. You can never afford them if it just goes up and up and up and up and up. That's the, that's, that defeats the whole point of the stock market. It was always supposed to be able to go up and down. The, the issue is, is sometimes things are worth less and when they are worth less, that makes it easier for the little guys to get in. Not only in just buying stocks, but literally creating a business because suddenly the value of the big dude that you're going against has crashed. And when he's crashed, that's your chance to weasel in. Now, if all that big dude does is get bailed out, nothing is learned. You know, no, nothing is gained and the small guys can't catch up to the big guys. I mean, this, this is why I am sympathetic to... I have a great deal of love for my Democratic friends. They usually don't understand much about the Federal Reserve, but this is the diagnosis of the problem, is that there is a big disparity that is getting larger between the rich and the poor. Well, when you have a bill <clears throat> that is willing to spend, let me go ahead and go back to it, uh, $877 billion bailing out businesses and... and a lot less to bail you out. What do you think is going to happen when the rich got a when when the rich people who own successful companies get a bailout that is larger than the poor people who own companies that are struggling along? Do you think that is going to increase or decrease the disparity between the rich the rich and the poor in the United States? I'm not one of those guys that says I I, I firm. This is my issue with so socialism and stuff like that. I firmly reject that flattening is best for everybody that that everybody should have the same amount of money but i think a lot of democrats like that are rational headed don't even want that they just want to be able to say i know that i work really hard and i'm not making what i deserve and that is absolutely true even if you've only earned one legitimate dollar in your entire life because of bad policies that dollar likely should have been at least three dollars we are rocking our laborers and rewarding our cronies. And that is, I, I guess for me, that is kind of my, my, my bone to throw to the democratic, not party because they are all scumbags, no, but most, most people who are democratic democrats, people. Yeah. yeah. Most people who are democrats are just democrats because they're anti-republican and they see the poor people in the country getting squashed. Yeah. Uh, now you've got socialists who are trying to push and say, oh, this is the solution to that. More government invention, more, more government that's causing this problem uh, will fix it. And it's like, no, that's, that's not how it works. Right? But even so, a lot, I mean, I, I think you need no look no further than the Biden versus Sanders primary and see how that went to see that even a lot of Democrats aren't that far get, gone. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's the thing is a lot of people are thinking, when's that going to happen when the, uh, the progressives basically take over the Democratic Party? And I'm like, you guys aren't there yet. I mean, I mean, they've made a lot of strides and I think libertarians should learn from how they achieved a lot of the success that they have now, mm -hmm. because we seem to do the exact opposite. And we, instead of incrementalism, we want to do all overnight, mm -hmm. uh, which you see, which works, you know, the, Repub the libertarians are still trying to get a seat at the table and the progressives are now, you know, pushing a lot of this around, but yep. the democratic party is not a progressive party. Um, as a majority just yet so progressives were operating and i and i, I dislike most of I, i'll just say most of the progressive points but they've been working on this since the 1800s i mean this is this is not this is something that was laid down as a blueprint that they said okay and then here's what the next generation is going to do and the next generation is going to do and the next generation is going to do and and this was their blueprint you know, I love that libertarians are so passionate. I love liberty loving people. I think it's an honorable goal to want the world set free in your lifetime. It might not happen. And that's, you're, I, I, I'm not going to say that's okay. Anybody not free, I am not okay with that fundamentally. But we need to be able to say, hey, the world's not free. Here's the steps to get there. 
maybe I'm okay with that happening in 200 years as long as the world is on a path to get set free. Let's, let's you, be more free tomorrow than we were today. And let's take that as a win and then work on getting more free the day after that. Let's right. not try to make this whole big chasm step in one day. Let's get there. But let's get there by getting there a, day, a little bit at a time every day and we'll get there. Even the, the best revolutions in history, when you just look at, I, I love that we, and I know we looked into this at We Are Libertarians and had a show on it about why peaceful revolution tends to be more successful than violent revolution. But we also looked at the natures of both violent and peaceful revolutions and why they were successful. And there's a huge amount of tact behind them. Just a huge amount of thought. They don't just preach. Like you can easily become a zombie and NPC for freedom. It is a good thing, but I still want you to be able to be there because you're using your own mind, not because you're just like freedom good government bad i don't want you to just hear the word government and get triggered and start twitching out you know you need to be able to have a rational bottom line is everybody else on this planet besides you and a handful of people except that government has a role to play if you don't believe that like me then you're you need to start convincing them as opposed to just making them feel bad because what man i love that we're on the subject because what happens when you say um when you call all democrats bernie bros well, we've already seen the Democrats say Bernie Fan Sanders is too far left. But when you start pushing them into that camp, oh, Bernie bro, Bernie bro, you push them farther left. We saw this happen with Republicans. I mean, there was a million stories with this when you say, what happens when all you do is call Republicans racist like an idiot? Oh, we've seen that happen. You get Trump and stuff. Do you want Republicans to be as far right as Trump? Probably not. Do you want them to be doing these? I mean, Trump's not even far right. I mean, let's, he doesn't know what he believes in. I mean, based on this stimulus and everything yeah, he's a, else. He's a populist as well. Right. So right. right. He's a populist. He right. But do you want the, the Republican Party to be, I won't say far right or left, but where it is right now, maybe stop calling every Republican or libertarian who believes in like a border racist. I am super anti-border but if you, if you start by calling them racist, you're not trying to evangelize anybody or change anybody's mind into doing anything. You're just trying to be an asshole. And you're doing that correctly, but that's not going to make that. Not only are they, that's going to distance the Democrats from the Republicans, that's going to distance you from them. And the only way we are going to succeed is if we bring more of them on. I hate Donald's, Donald Rumsfeld, but you go to war with the army you have, and right now we would lose with the amount of troops that we have. So if you want a war, which may come eventually for you liberty-loving people, if you want a chance to fight for it, you need the numbers to fight for it. You need the situation to fight for it. And right now you are just fighting a losing battle by just spouting off about how bad it is and not trying with everything that is within you to make the most compassionate, compelling, intelligent argument that you possibly can to bring people in to liberty. I think the reason that this stimulus bill, it's important to talk about during the stimulus bill, because this is where they all came together. This is where our politicians came together on spending all of this money. And it's because of a problem that they kind of came together in creating. I mean, we're talking global coming together. Governments all over the place coming together to say it's not a big deal. This was not just Trump. I mean, there's tons of governments that were like, not a big deal, not a big deal, don't worry about it. I mean, China kept this under wraps. Some people are now saying maybe for years. <laughs> I guess based on the models that we have, possibly years that they knew about this virus. And what they say, not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know, if you start, if you start focusing on these things and trying to solve the problems, it's just going to create more problems. Let's, and now what do let's, you got? let's save some money by getting rid of the, the uh, pandemic task force. Don't need yep. that. Right. I mean, and this is, again, don't go for the high hanging fruit. Cause I see libertarians see oh, pandemic task force. Well, we shouldn't have that. Okay. But there was, there's no free market alternative that is permitted right now in place of right. that. So don't be an NPC. Understand that this is how government functions. It's going to exist. I know you hate this, that even in a full-on collapse, which you collapsitarians think, think you want, look at Somalia, look at Greece, and tell me that those two countries have no government right now. 
They absolutely do. And the government is probably a little stronger than it was before their collapses. You know, it, 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 what we had was a collapse and maybe an opportunity to step in and be liberty minded, but because there was no culture for it, there is no culture of lending liberty, people didn't build it back up. You know, in Somalia, you kind of had a fighting chance. There was like a small pocket of, of anarchists that were, there was four fighting factions and that was easily the smallest faction and not even, not even like close. They could have multiplied their numbers by like a hundred and been the size of the third largest faction in Somalia. I mean, there is just not a culture yet of loving liberty. So use these moments as opportunities. Instead of droning on like an NPC and saying, stimulus bad, fed bad, explain why. People have a lot of problems right now. I am sure if you're listening to this, the virus has impacted you in some way that's probably negative either by the health of a family member or by your financial situation or by digging into your fund, your retirement funds or savings or whatever it may be. And you are not alone. Everybody had a problem. The government kind of created the problem and now has presented a solution that is probably as bad or a push or a wash on the problem. But the thing is they push for a solution because people wanted it. You need to make them want your solution and see it as a solution. Libertarians get all brutalist because we believe in individualism. We say, this is, you know, you're all on your own on this one. I couldn't think of anything further from the truth for liberty because we need community. No one survives by themselves. That's just not the way society works. We're not animals. Even animals form packs. We just form communities based on individuals instead of forming individuals that best fit the mold of the community you absolutely still need to believe the value of community. And just because it has the word calm in it isn't a reason to go all freak out and think I'm talking about some kind of communist society, which is something that almost all libertarians don't want, right? And not get so triggered by those that do that you allow it to dissuade, to, to, to make your whole message fall apart. That we love community, we love society. We simply believe in shaping it in a way that's best for the individual instead of allowing these societies to shape individuals in ways that are worse for them. And this is so important because then we can begin on the solution and say, what would you like to see your community do if there was some type of pandemic like this? Because you have a ton of options. You even have the government option. You can still get forward, get together and say like, yeah, we'll pool all our funds and just print out a whole bunch of money and, and give it all away and shut people down and make sure they don't go out outside of their doors. Or you could do the other opposite of the government solution, which is absolutely nothing. Have fun on spring break. Go kiss your grandma afterwards. Lick a whole bunch of toilets on airplanes. Both are pretty bad solutions, but at least you could find a community that matches your solution. The best solution is probably somewhere in between those two, but does this government ever do anything that is a rational thing in between two sides or do they normally push for whoever is in power's side to win? And that's probably what they do. It's just what we recognize and what we know to be a fact. And I think this is, like I said, this is important to talk about because I know we're supposed to be talking about stimulus right now in this new package. We're going to find out more about that in the coming days, but we need to understand how this came to pass. How did we get to this point where we're doing what Venezuela and Nigeria did and the Weimar Republic did that failed? Why are we doing this? Because we didn't have any other choice other than this government choice. And the, the fault is still on them. I don't believe in this moral like, oh, you libertarians didn't fight hard enough. It's a fight that we shouldn't have to fight. Yes, everybody should be free. Everybody kind of knows that, but we're not. And so what we need to do is act like we are not free, understand we're not free, and help others off of the plantation. When we wanted to end slavery, good, liberty-loving people created an underground railroad and a way out. You need to be the one that offers the way out, not just saying, man, you're still on that plantation sucks bro shouldn't be working for that plantation owner bro we know that government will act poorly just like plantation owners would if their slaves decided to leave and if their slaves even decided to ask nicely if they could leave they would suffer their families would suffer 
you need to be the one creating an underground railroad. You need the one be creating a solution. Those are kind of my final thoughts on Ryan, Reinhold. And, and you can take as long as you want, because I'm aware I just had like a long speech there. But uh, <laughs> as long as you want for your final thoughts. I, I, I think we'll probably be close to wrapping it up here. I, I, my thoughts are, are fairly much the same. I mean, we, we've got to uh, get to a place where we can effectively change people's minds and hearts. Most people want freedom. Most people want um, things to be taken care of, but they also want to make sure their neighbors are taken care of. They want to be able to make sure that they're going to get up and have a job the next day. And they don't know of the solution that's going to do that. And if they've been told of a solution, uh, it sounds far fetched. They want to see it proven. So we have to be able to get some things in act to say, okay, look, this, what we said is working. Let's try a little bit more of what we said. And then we're going to get more people to say, okay, let's give them a chop because they're actually getting things done. And this, this situation has proven that what we've been saying is working because we're pulling back on government regulations. We're pulling back on what the uh, government is limiting companies from doing and people are responding in a, in a positive light. Let's keep on that. Let's show, okay, now that we've seen that that's worked, maybe we can talk about, a CDC that's not politicized, a CDC that is actually operation outside of government, and we can rely on it to give us the right information instead of always questioning it because of who's in office at the time for our partisanship or our political thoughts. Um, so when when you see people who are uh, in the other party or in the party you don't like, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're that far away from you. They they probably think that the problems are the same as the problems you think they are. They just don't realize the solution. Uh, their solution is flawed. Uh, and we just need to explain to that. And that's when your ideas win. Win on ideas, not on trying to bash people's heads in with a brick. Yep. You know, you don't, you don't tie a, t uh, um, you're not going to succeed if you tie a, uh, uh, taxation is theft t-shirt around a brick and hit them in the head with it. That's not going to work. You need to convince them uh, through, through thought. And if you can't do that, then get somebody who can and find and point people to play people who can and, and just try to get the message out there. And that's really all I had to say about that. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I think uh, when you talk about the ideas, they're not just hypotheticals. We are, we have history that vindicates these ideas. If you care to study history and you and I have just been talking about this whole time over and over. There are private companies that are doing the right thing when everybody else is doing the wrong thing. This is your chance to point to those companies and say, you want the solution. There it is. And in, mo in many cases, you can be the solution for somebody to say, well, who would get my groceries? Who would do this? Who would do that? Man, right now, that's you. Who's going to run these blood drives? Who's going to house these homeless? We have people on this network showing that they will be the ones to do it when government fails to do so. I just think, uh, yeah, I, I love this whole conversation with you, Ryan, Reinhold. I appreciate it. I know that we are acting quickly. It's not even signed yet. We don't have, we don't have all our cards out yet. And I'm sure more is going to come up that we're going to say, oh, I wish I could have talked more about that, that, and that. But uh, we'll, stay we'll hit it again. Yeah, in the future. I'm sure we'll talk more about this. Oh, yeah. $2 trillion uh, spending time. bill. I mean, I, <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. It might, it might come up again. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe, you know, at least in 40 years, we'll be looking about uh, why our names are next to the uh, Weimar Republic in Venezuela and Nigeria. We'll be like, oh, I get it now. So it'll come up. It'll come up. Anyway, not to be doom and gloom on you. This, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. Like I said, it may, it'll catch up with us eventually. Hopefully not this time, but we'll see. Uh, guys, you have a good night. Thanks for tuning in to We Are Libertarians. Patreon members, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for keeping us afloat. You guys, and before we go, make yeah. sure uh, Liberty and Chill is happening over in the uh, We Are Libertarians Discord. So if you're when done here, uh, if you're watching live right now, if you're uh, if you want to keep going, keep talking, we're going to be jumping over there, uh, where the party's already been going for about an hour and a half, and uh, uh, we'll hope to see you then too. Yeah, if you're not on the We Are Libertarians Discord, it is very active, and uh, you get the opportunity to do Liberty and Chill. Are they doing it pretty much every Friday now? It seems like. Yeah, well, it's every Friday, but since we've, it's in person every Friday, but this right. uh, shutdown, we decided to start doing it uh, virtually. So we're doing virtual uh, Liberty and Chills every Friday at seven. Uh, we just happened to kind of double book on this one and uh, through some uh, non-communication, miscommunication, things like that. So yeah, <laughs> no worries. So, we'll get it. We'll get it. Yeah. Get, get it get popping it. over there, guys. You get a chance to talk with people like me, like Reinhold, like Harry Price and all those people here on the show, including some other Patreon members 
fellow Patreon members. So it's a cool place. Right to now, be. I know I think Chris DeCosta is in the uh, chat talking and uh, Scalge is in there as well as uh, a few others. And it's a Cooper. So there's uh, there some go. fun people over there right now. Yeah. Get over there, guys. Thanks again. Keep connected with us. Stay safe and have a great day.